It is, I think, one minute before three or a few seconds before three o'clock. Uh, so I'll, uh, uh, I'll take a, a, a minute at the start. Uh, welcome, all of you. Uh, I, uh, I, I can't help but uh, compliment Clement, uh, the, probable, the probable quality and interest that his talk has generated uh, in filling this room to capacity today. Uh, with a number of faces I've seen quite often here, and, uh, and also, of course, uh, a, a few of you who have been less frequent. Uh, clearly, what we need to do is more frequently throw down the Christmas party version of the Chair's Lecture Series and make sure the booze is always free. Uh, I know that we don't have that much food, so it can't be the food that brought you here, so we'll just blame the alcohol. <laughs> But really, it's, it's been a, a great pleasure this last couple of months uh, to, uh, to continue to be able uh, to host this event. Uh, I am anticipating that today's talk will be uh, up there, if not over the top, in terms of, <laughs> of the quality of the presentations we've heard uh, from all of you this past term and, of course, last year. Uh, we will again right after Christmas, uh, and I now have suddenly blanked on who, I think it's Kirst. No, that's I'm next. Heather's yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Heather's next, uh, and that's early January. January 10th. January 10th. Uh, so Heather is next in line. Uh, we'll see if we can come up with uh, at least an ode to the new year and, uh, and offer free drinks again at the, uh, the January inception of the party. Uh, I'm going to have to run because, of course, there's always something where the department is slightly on fire. Uh, today is one of those days. I might make it back before the end of Clement's talk. If not, Heather's going to moderate the, I'm sure to be, uh, violent and angry question period uh, at the end. And in advance, I'm going to present you with your department swag, Clement. Thank you very much. Very much. Okay, I've got it. I don't need to give my togs in. Yep, yep. I'll just go home. But yes, uh, the floor is yours, and please enjoy, and hopefully I'll be back. Thank you very much for coming. I was going to say something about the free booze, but he's done it already. So, uh, so for those of you who remember, I gave my, semi my interview seminar about uh, parasite manipulation and zombies and things like that. So you might have expected that, but I, because I'd done it already, I thought I'd do something new. But also, I kind of came to realize when I give those talks about parasite manipulation, zombies, people are always like, yeah, it's really cool, but in the grand scheme of things, it's just like a tiny detail of evolution of e or ecology or whatever you want to call it. And anecdotically, this morning, I, I got reminded that as parasitologists, we often boxed into something that's aside from a lot of the bigger picture biology we do. Like, if you do fish stuff, you're even going to call yourself fish biologist. If, if you're an ecologist, you, you're calling yourself ecologist, but as soon as you say parasitologist, people tell you, oh, you're studying that thing. So today I'm going to try to show through some of my work how you cannot get the full picture about what you're studying without trying to see what the parasite can do to that. And I like that quote because it kind of illustrate what I'm saying. When you look at parasites, you are by definition an ecologist, because if you look at parasites, you are looking at at least a parasite on its host, which is interaction, which is ecology. <laughs> and it's only one parasite with one host, but when you think about it, it's actually a whole suit of levels into parasitology. So if you use a Russian doll, doll sorry, you open like, you got the host, you open it, you got the parasite, but you can keep opening it until whichever level you want. But there are so many layers to parasitology that we are more as parasitologists are just a guy studying that thing. Uh, the funny part is that uh, Jonathan Swift, we, who was a poet in the 18th century, he was English, was absolutely not talking about parasite in a biological sense of the term. He was talking about his fellow writers and poets. He was basically saying like, there are a couple of geniuses and everybody else is feeding off them. <laughs> And he was probably putting himself into the top category. <laughs> but that's basically what, like, so today is going to be about trying to put parasites into a wider context and 
trying to show you that if you don't, if you refuse to see that, then you are missing something. And of course, going with that kind of title, I had to go with that kind of picture. As an advice, do not, as ever, Google Parasite and I. <laughs> if you are squeamish, just do not do that to yourself, okay? Uh, so I managed to find an example that wasn't too gross, but that's uh, a parasite into a noise. So that's actually a copepod parasite that uh, infects specifically the eye of Greenland sharks. So if you know anything about Greenland sharks, they are one of the longest living species on Earth. I think they've been aged like 450 years for some of them. As they grow super slow, they live in extreme environment, full darkness, cold, and yet 99% of those sharks uh, are but one copepod parasite on, in each eye. So even if you go to the super extreme environment for parasites, they will be there. They will find a way. You, you've all watched uh, Jurassic Park, the shitty quote, life will find a way. Well, you can be sure that parasite will even find a better way. <laughs> so if I say that, then you're going to ask, well, if, if they're so good at finding ways, why haven't parasites taken over the world already? Well, the truth is, <laughs> they have. You just don't want to see it. You just haven't noticed, you just don't want to because it's kind of freaky to think about it that way. But the truth is, it's, I can't blame you, because the, the truth is, if you don't look for that, you, it's not obvious, as that's mainly because parasites are actually embedded in life itself. When you look outside, you see ecosystem, you see life. But if you want to find the parasites, you need to look deeper. How many of you haven't seen the parasite yet on the picture? Okay, everybody have seen it? It's just peekaboo, it's right in there. Uh, but most people looking at acute Nemo and anemones won't go further. But the truth is you need to go further because there's always a deeper layer. And it's like that Russian doll image I was talking about. If you start digging, then you find. And these guys are actually uh, tongue-eating isopods. So I've got some here that I smuggled from New Zealand. Do not ask me how I did it. <laughs> But they came all the way from New Zealand with me. So these guys are really cool. So if you look at that fish, that poor fish got two. And the big fat one here is a female. The smaller ones down there is a male. And to show you very quickly how extraordinary parasites can be, when you find a fish with a tongue-eating isopod in, inside, there's either one large female alone, uh, one large female with one or several males, but there's never a male in there alone. How is that possible? Sex change, sir. <laughs> so larvae of those guys are asexual. Because chances of getting to a fish are pretty slim. Ch chances of getting to a fish where there's already a congener of the opposite sex is even slimmer. So what you do is you lay out larvae that are asexual, they get to a fish, first one in becomes a female, second one in becomes a male. Problem solved. Only parasites can do that. But if you look at the bigger picture, there's your fish, there's your tongue-eating isopod. Again, they don't, they don't occur in a vacuum. You don't have just that fish and that tongue-eating isopod. And first thing first, usually you've got the host and the parasite is represented underneath because a lot of people by definition will put parasite below free living organisms. But the truth is that parasite is feeding on that mullet. So technically it's, it's one trophic level, level above, not below. <laughs> so first correction, parasites are above what you, <laughs> most free living species. But that's a very simplified uh, situation. The truth is in any ecosystem you'll have uh, other predators, so that mullet is, can be eaten by a, do you say shag in Canadian or it's almost yeah, only carmine? Okay, yeah, that's, yeah, because like in New Zealand they call shag, but if I start yelling shag around here, it might be a bit controversial. So let's call it a carmine. That carmine will feed on the mullet, and most people then, at that point, the parasite just disappears, goes back into its vacuum. But the truth is, it's not, it's still in the fish. So at that point, the parasite becomes protein, becomes a prey, and it's still uh, within the food web, so it becomes energy for the bird. 
And then, it's, of course, that mullet probably has more parasites, and chances are it's carrying a larvae of parasite X that probably will need to get into a bird to complete its life cycle. And once again, that parasite shouldn't be put under the bird but above it. So just by adding the parasites to that food web, you're actually increasing its complexity by two levels. So parasites are, are more than mere passengers of uh, food webs and trophic links because they are actually in it, they're part of it, and most will actually end up above the top predators because they are feeding of those top predators. And, but the thing is, is, if you look at the literature, it's only very, very recently that parasites have been started to be added into complex food webs. So before that, you basically had uh, primary producers and free-living organisms, which are the, the consumers. And the food web is already pretty complex, but as soon as you start adding the parasites, then you end up with higher trophic levels, more links, and more trophic levels as well. And that's only for the ones that are, this one only represents the actual transmission. But then you start adding the concomitant predation, so when the parasites actually end up in uh, consumers that will digest them, then the number of links and the number of trophic levels go crazy, it just goes over the roof. And that's only for the actual connection, we're not even talking about biomass. So there's even parts of the parasite importance that we are still missing, because it's complex, I agree, it's really complex to quantify all that. But again, you've already seen that just by adding the presence or absence of parasite, you comp everything becomes more complex. But we only starting to scratch the surface of what parasite can do in ecosystems like that. So basically, that's the goal of my uh, talk today, is use like a three case study of what I've done so far to try to show you that there's a lot of misconception about parasites. So I'll talk about the biomass of parasites. I'll talk about the fact that parasites are often considered as simplified life form. Very early and probably I'm, I'm being a bit kind of, I'm pushing it, because, but early on, a lot of ecologists and biologists were like, no, parasites are just dead ends. They're like former free living organisms that kind of find themselves in a dead end and they'll disappear. Like parasites are just nuisance. But I'm going to show you that actually parasites have developed adaptations and way of life that are basically like, I consider in free living organisms to be like the top of the evolution. And parasites have developed the same kind of adaptations. And the last one is probably one that's still slightly controversial is that when you're looking at anthropogenic impacts and ecosystem parasites are almost always uh, disregarded. It's like, nah. You, you, you look at uh, free living organisms, but you never look at parasites. One example is my partner did a PhD on uh, Tuatara or Sphenodonts in New Zealand, which are like a very specific reptile, endangered, a lot of conservation efforts uh, done on it, and a lot of translocation. So they take individuals, tr like translocate them to other uh, highlands or populations. And every time they do that, they remove the ticks from the, from the, from the reptiles. But those ticks are specific to, this, to these reptiles. So they are basically as endangered as a reptile. But as soon as you say parasite, people want to get rid of them. But if those parasites go extinct, that's, a, that's another species we've lost, regardless of whether they're parasitic or not. So it's really something that we, we need to focus more on. So first, first thing first, or I haven't lost anyone so far, just like, my slideshow is all right, but I didn't uh, repeat my talk at all, so I'm, if I'm starting to lose you, just please stop me. So first of all, I'm, that's something I did in, uh, in New Zealand, so the whole goal was to try to put, to look at parasites uh, into ecosystems, so, and food webs specifically. So what I did for like three years was, uh, of my postdoc, I chose four lakes, uh, and sampled everything in those lakes uh, at four sites, so the, the little square. But basically, uh, I sampled everything that moved or did at least lived in those lakes. We spent a lot of a lot of time in the field. So just to show you, I thought I would throw a bit of New Zealand in there. So that's one of the lakes I was studying uh, with like the Southern Alps in the background. Really nice day. It wasn't always like that, unfortunately, as you can see. And I know you're going to tell me, yeah, right, whatever, he's coming from New Zealand to Canada, you're not going to tell me it was cold. 
But actually, I think that day was about 80 k's of uh, south southerly wind. The water was about three degrees, so it was slightly cold. I'll give you that. I haven't done any winter field work in Canada, so we'll talk about it later. I'll give you that. So we, we caught a few really cool fish. I thought I'd throw this one in because there's probably some fly fishermen in the room. Uh, if you look at the back of the picture, it's actually Dunedin, so that uh, the city I was living in, so that small lake was basically in town. So you could just like literally walk out and catch fish. That, trout, that brown trout was about five kilos as a, as a recall. So if you like your fly fishing, uh, just go to New Zealand. Uh, that specific fish was a longfin eel, which is endemic to New Zealand. Uh, my permit said I could uh, kill it for dissection to include in my sampling. But the truth is a specific fish worth about nine kilos and was probably between 80 and 100 years old. So when he came to it, I was like, nah, I just throw it back in the water. That's one of the uh, really specific uh, species you get into uh, islands. So yeah, those, those eels live up to about 100 years. So when he came down to it, I just couldn't do it. Uh, and that fish is also endemic to New Zealand. It's one of the most endangered fish in New Zealand. It's a giant kokopo, which is a Maori name. Uh, so I, I just like, if you're interested in fish biology and fish, just, you can come and talk to me about these guys after, but I thought I would throw the picture in there. So after we, I've done the sampling, I dissected everything, which added up to about uh, 650,000 uh, free-living organisms. It's got nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about today, but I thought I would just brag a bit, <laughs> because you don't go through that many uh, dissections without bragging a bit about it. What I I'm going to talk about though is about the 600 fish about I dissected for parasites. So I just threw a, a couple of pictures of what I found. This one is a really cool one. I don't know if you can really see it, but those kind of cloudy, whitey things are parasites. And these guys live in the eye of the fish. And uh, another student in my lab showed that they were actually there were like dial variation in where the parasite positions themselves in the eye to try and block the fish's view so they were easier to predate. But uh, I don't have the video, but there was a video of that one of those worms actually moving across the eye like that and you, you could see people go like, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> But just to show you how parasite can be, uh, how infection can be in fish, that's uh, basically the tail of a small fish with a spine, the tail, a bit of flesh squished into between two glass plates. And all the small uh, blobs here are parasites. There's actually three different species. Uh, this one that's perfectly round, like others that look a bit different. But that's basically the kind of infection levels we're talking about. So why do I show you that? Because what I did with those fish is I, I actually estimated the biomass of parasites in each fish to try and have a better grasp of what parasites in terms of mass would represent into a fish. And I did that because parasites are often assumed to contribute very little to biomass in ecosystem. However, some uh, recent studies uh, done in California on three different ecosystems, Australian ecosystems, so they're a bit specific because Australian ecosystems are known to carry a lot of parasites, but still, what they did, they estimated the biomass for the whole ecosystem and put it on, a, so it's a bit of a, it's a logarithmic scale, but still it's a biomass of uh, parasite per hectare. And if you look at the biomass of trematodes, which are the flatworms or flukes, they're actually equivalent to the, biom the total biomass of birds for the same ecosystem. So when we're talking about negligible biomass for parasites, but you put it into perspective with what are considered to top predators in the ecosystem, they're actually about equivalent. So just to put it into perspective. Then you start having a different ideas of what parasite can be in an ecosystem. But for my particular study, I wanted to look at the, indi at the individual level. So parasite biomass within an individual, is it significant or negligible? And does it make any difference with, when you're starting to try to estimate body conditions? Like in fish, body condition indexes are used 
everywhere for like any any time you look at fish people will cal calculate body condition indexes and often to look at uh, the effect of disease parasite pollutants but to look at the effect of parasites is actually quite common the only situation where people will account for the mass of the parasites is when looking at sticklebacks and schistocephalus solidus which is a massive parasite compared to the size of the host so obviously if you look at that fish the pinkish mass is actually just parasite mass and if you don't account for that biomass of parasites it doesn't make any sense however it is the only situation where people have actually removed the mass of the parasite before looking at the mass of the fish the question is when you look at smaller parasite does it matter so if you look at the picture here it's a fish you can see one half decent sized parasite it's a nematode so you can see it coiled around in there but all those smaller white dots here are individual trematodes so if I take that fish I measure, measure it, weigh it and calculate the body condition index does the mass of the parasite inside it influence what I'm calculating so that's what I wanted to look at so what I did I used a very specific species of fish which is a common bully it's a small goby eat fish very abundant so you can get enough numbers to do this kind of calculation so what I did is for each fish I actually estimated the biomass of parasites uh, within the fish then I calculated the body condition index for that fish and I did it with and without parasite to try to look at whether it had an effect on the body condition index you're calculating so if you look at it including the parasite mass within the fish mass you end up with a positive correlation so if you look at the graph any fish that's on the left of the y-axis is below average in terms of body condition and any fish that's uh, below the x-axis is below average in, ten, in term of uh, parasite mass so if you those fish had more than average of parasite within them and those fish were above average in terms of their body condition and if you look at it the more parasites those fish had uh, the better conditions they seem to be but that's with the parasite mass inside of them so then you start asking the question which is kind of counterintuitive because then fish with more parasites seems to be doing better and most people try to show the opposite but the truth is if you remove then the parasite mass from the fish mass you end up with the opposite so it's a very weak trend but still there's enough parasite within that fish to offset the relationship between infection and body condition in those fish so the truth is then you end up with what kind of is often expected that the parasite actually ne negatively affect the fish but if you don't go through the effort of removing that parasite mass from the fish then you lose part of the picture so just conclusion you clearly overestimate the, the fish body condition if you do not account for parasite tissue but when you think about it it's a no-brainer because parasite tissue are not actually host tissue so they shouldn't be included into the, the fish tissue in the first place and that's especially true when you're trying to look at the effect of the parasite on that fish it's just like it's like trying to look at I don't know, the top of my head, the, like the effect of egg laying in chickens if you keep the egg mass into the chicken, basically. Like it, it basically accounts to that. All right, so the next one is, I'm, I'm trying to wring the neck off. It's parasite, I simplified life form. And that came from early observation of if you look at a group of organisms where some are free living and some are parasitic the trends is that often the free living organisms are complex compared to the parasitic so if you look at copepods they have all those really complex appendages they swim they have like a lot of kind of receptors like all those uh, silk and hair and everything and if you look at the same uh, family but in parasitic forms then they're highly simplified so that's a copepod believe it or not so all it's end up with is like an attaching structure to attach to the host and gonads so that's basically an anchor with a rope and a big bag of gonad at the end so if you look at that fish 
you see a copepod, so the attaching uh, structure is in the fish, and the rest is basically a, some gonads. And in a lot of those species, that would be a female, and the males are actually reduced to uh, testes. There's no morphology for males. So early on, a lot of ecologists and biologists and scientists were using that argument to say, well, parasites are actually super simple organisms, they're simplified organisms. Same, and he actually, that's repeated across a lot of uh, different groups of uh, organisms where there's free living, so that's an isopod, so legs, antennae, structural uh, shell, and a whole lot of different derived uh, characteristics. And that, believe it or not, again, that's an isopod. It's just literally a bag of gonads. Uh, that's another isopod, so you can still see kind of the segments, but there's no uh, shell, there's no limbs, and uh, like I said before, often the males are actually reduced to a tiny, like basically the males are only testes in a lot of those species, so there's no, not even morphology for those males. But the truth is, is that <coughs> the complexity parasites appear to lack in like morphology, they make up, they often make up for in strategy. Because if you take that tongue eating uh, parasite, well, then it's slightly simpler in form than a lot of his free living uh, congeners, but its life is actually really complicated because he needs to make it from a fish to another fish, and that's much harder than just releasing eggs or larvae into the environment. So, what they've lost in complexity, apparently in, in morphology, they had to make it for in their life strategies. And one of the best examples of that are trematodes, which is one uh, type of parasite I've studied extensively. So trematodes are flukes, so small flatworms, so morphologically they seem very simple. Often there's like a couple of attachment structure and the main function is produce eggs. So they're usually big gonads producing massive quantity of eggs. But their life history uh, includes at least three hosts, uh, plus a lot of different free-swimming larvae, so even if they look morphologically, morphologically simple, trematodes have a really hard life. And they've had to come up with a lot of very complex strategies to try and complete that, uh, life, those life cycles. Uh, about 99% of trematodes use snails as first in intermediate hosts, uh, so that's a snail. And all the orange mass you can see in the snail here is actually parasites. So that's a non-infected snail. So that's a marine snail, but the brown is a digestive gland. The white is a gonads. And when they get infected, basically the parasite take over the uh, gonad and they just fill up the, the snail. So what that mass is, is actually from one egg or larva. Uh, the parasites will divide into a clonal colony of Partenite. So they're all clonal, they're all genetically identical. And the function of those bags, they're basically bags of uh, germinal cells. The function of those bags is to produce uh, larvae that will then leave the snail and infect the next host in the cycle. What's interesting in, those, uh, in that structure is that uh, in trematodes there's two forms of Partenite. One which is called sporosis, which is basically a bag that produces a larvae. And the other one uh, is radia, which is basically a bag that produces larvae. Okay, but the main difference is that the radiae actually have a mouth and uh, a very simple uh, digestive system. So sporosis will get energy from their host through the tegument, they just absorb energy but radii can actually uh, chew at tissues, so they will chew their way through the host tissues to get food. Why is, is that dif difference vital? Is because that structure actually allows uh, radii to also attack uh, competitors. And in, like in the last 10 years, it's been discovered that in trematodes that use radii, some species have developed division of labor. And division of labor has been epitomized by social insects, which are considered kind of top of the evolution in insects. They are like, the, like they are super evolved organisms. Well, guess what? The parasites have figured that out as well. So some species will have reproductive forms, which are proportionally huge, uh, spitting out those larvae, 
But along those big guys, you, you'll find really small forms of, and again, they are genetically identical. They are the same, like same genetic material. But some of them will be, are tiny, do not produce larvae, and have proportionally big uh, mouse parts. And very early on, that was kind of, question was, why would that happen? And early on, people were like, oh no, they're just juveniles. They will grow up to become the reproductive <coughs> form of the parasite. But actually, they don't. In, in most species, when you look at the colony as a whole, the clonal colony, you, you will have very large individuals that produce larvae, and then a bunch of very small individuals that actually never switch to becoming reproductive. And you end up, so that's just uh, the length of the paternity and the width. So you end up with short and skinny individuals and like long and fat that produce the larvae. And if you look at the distribution size, so it's been transformed into volume, you get that binomial distribution where there's like some reproductive and some soldiers, but very, very few intermediate forms, which really shows that they are two different cars, like soldiers and workers in uh, ant or bee colony. Not only that, but the small ones are actually highly aggressive. Uh, if you put them in vitro and offer them like uh, competitors or snail tissue or something to fight, the big fat one producing larvae will almost never attack. But the small ones we actually act actively wriggle towards the target and actively chew on the target. So this one is a soldier from like uh, one species and he actually actively attacking a reproductive from another species. So you, it's actually attaching with its mouse part and biting at it. So obviously it's not gonna eat the whole thing, but by damaging it, it it's likely to kill it. And actually if you look at that system in vitro, they will, it, this one, this small one will eventually kill the, the, be, the large competitor. And you've got another one here actually literally eating uh, a partenita from another species of competitor that developed really small partenita, but it's basically grabbed it by the neck and will swallow the whole thing. And the last kind of proof that it's not just a, a by chance is that if you look at the whole snail, so that snail is infected by a, a trematode species with division of labor, most uh, soldiers, so the small ones, will be located towards the head of the snail. And the further down you go on the snail, the less soldiers you'll, you'll have. And it's been hypothesized that because most further infection by competitors will come through the opening of the shell. So they will come uh, through the head. So there's no point in having soldiers over there if your competitors are going to come in through here. It's like an ant nest. You don't put the soldiers at the back of the colony. You put them at the entrance because then they, they kind of intercept whatever is trying to get in. So all of that was very well, but the truth is, before I, get in, I got into that, there, there had been no study showing that division of labor, so that the species I was using, which is Philophthalmus, you don't have to remember, but that's one reproductive uh, partenita with all the soldiers going around. It hasn't been shown whether or not that division of labor and the presence of soldiers can actually eliminate competition or prevent um, infection by competitors within the snail host. So that's what I aimed out to do. So what I did is I take two, uh, like the snails, you find infected or infected ones. So I looked at whether the division of labor could prevent infection by a competitor. So I took a group of uninfected snails, a group of snails infected by my focal parasites. I exposed them to infection by a competitor for six months. And at the end, I dissected them to see whether that competitor was able to infect or not. And I did uh, the opposite. So I looked at whether the parasite could eliminate competition. So this time, I actually selected three groups of uh, snails, one infected by my focal species, one infected by uh, two species at the same time, and one infected by only the competitor. And for 12 months, I looked at the production of uh, those free living larvae and used them as a proxy for colony expansion or decrease. So if over time the snail started producing more and more larvae, I assumed that the colony was growing. And if they produced less and less, I assumed that the colony was decreasing. And at the end, I dissected them just to have a final look at what happened. 
So interestingly enough, uh, snails that had been exposed for six months to uh, potential infection by competitors. Uh, so the gray ones are the snails that were uninfected at the beginning. So as you can see, there was actually one that got exposed to no uh, infection risk, but still develop uh, the infections. That's probably because when I screened all the snails, that infection was too young for me to be able to detect it. So it basically acts act as a control. So one snail out of 200 and something actually had an infection to start with and developed it along the, along the way. But as expected, the more you expose the snail to a potential infection, the more they picked up infection. But interestingly enough, the snails that were already infected by the species with, with division of labor were more likely to pick up the competition. It's not actually that surprising. Often parasites will immunosuppress their host, making them more uh, likely to pick up more uh, other infections or other pathogens. But it is kind of counterintuitive in our scope because I was expecting the, the soldiers to be able to fend that off. They didn't. However, if you look at the cast ratio with the number of soldiers over the number of reproductors, so how many soldiers per reproductors, well, you end up with the, the snails that didn't pick up the infection by the competitors. The cast ratio was actually about the same, whether they were exposed or not, or how much they were exposed to, com to competition. But the snails that did pick up the infection by the competitors, then the colony of uh, the philophthalmus reacted and started producing more soldiers. So it seems that they cannot, they don't respond to the cue, they respond only when the infection actually occurs. So they cannot respond to uh, cues from the outside, but as soon as the competitor actually managed to get in, then they react. So basically they do not proact, they react. We kind of bring this to the, the next step. If they can't stop the infection from happening, can they then get rid of it? So if you look at the production of larvae to try to estimate the, how the colony reacts, if so the triangles are actually the number of larvae produced by the species with division of labor. So they stood different y-axis because the larvae produced by my focal species are huge. So they produce only about uh, between like five and 45 monthly because they're really, really big. If you look at the competitors, they, pr they produce between 500 and 3,500 larvae monthly, but they're tiny. So in terms of biomass, they produce about the same. But if you look at the species that's got soldiers, regardless of the fact they are competing with another species, as time goes by, they actually produce more and more and more and more larvae. So it seems that they, they do suffer from competition, but they actually still are able to increase the colony and increase the production of larvae, which is not the case for the, the species that do not use soldiers, the competitors that don't use soldiers. So if they're on their own, then as the snail grows, as the colony grows, they, will, they are able to produce more and more larvae. But when they are in competition with that species that, that develop soldiers, then they produce less and less and less and less. And when you dissect the snail, you actually, you actually realize that if you look at the species with division of labor, they did produce 1.5 times less larvae if, if they were competing even though they had about the same number of reproductive paternity, and they actually developed more soldiers. And I think two or three snails that actually had the competitors at the beginning of the experiment, because they were produced, the snail were producing larvae from the competitors. At the end, when I dissected them, that competi like the competition had disappeared. It'd, it'd been kicked out of the snail. So it seemed like the soldiers had actually do a good job at, at least limiting but decreasing as a colony of the competitor. Because if you look at the competitor, uh, they produce six times less larvae at the end than uh, when they were in competition with that species than when they were alone. And when they were in competition, that, uh, the number of paternity in the colony was six times less. So they are actually getting slowly but surely removed by the species with soldiers. So it's a slow process, but it seems that uh, soldiers do a good job at actually eliminating the competition. So even though they can't prevent the competition from coming in, because it seems that the <laughs> parasite is only reacting, not proacting, it's a slow process, but the soldiers are actually able to kill off the competition. 
Uh, so that's basically what I said, no prevention, slow elimination. Uh, it kind of begs the question about other threats because of course you've got competition but you also have uh, fungus, bacteria. So I ran another experiment to look at that and it seems like if you drill holes in the snail shell and use an expose the colony to fungal or bacterial infection, then the colony reacts as well and start producing more soldiers. I won't go into the details uh, now. I think I'm, I'm going a bit slow but still I've got a like, I like to put like a video kind of, at, sorry, I like to have like attention break during my lecture or why doesn't the bloody video start? No, it doesn't want to, should I click? No. I'll click on that, there you go. How's the sound? Yep. Sure. It's just to give you an idea of what people usually think of, of parasite. So that's my life. <laughs> but actually what will summarize what people think of parasite will be like by that blonde uh, lady. She, she'll summarize what parasite are all about for people at the end. It's the best part of the video. So just <laughs> there you go. That's what that's people only want to know that can I get it? <laughs> No, you cannot. As blonde as you are, you cannot get it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I should have... Can you remove that from the... <laughs> Alright, last part. I'll try to make it quick because I, I think I'm running slightly behind. Uh, so, uh, the last one is parasite as bioindicators. Uh, it basically is non-existent in the literature or almost non-existent. So I, I kind of bumped his, into that when I was doing a postdoc in France when I was looking at the terrestrial aquatic meta ecosystem and especially the impact of forestry and freshwater. Uh, being in Canada, it's probably, you've probably heard of that, like British Columbia does like a lot of studies about the effect of uh, forestry, especially headwater streams. Most studies come from Canada actually. So it's basically you've got one stream going through forest and what happens is that the forest is cut down and a lot of people are interested in the impact of that happening on the stream. That's because a lot of studies have shown that if you remove the forest or any vegetation, then you, you and run into problems. Uh, erosion still goes down to the stream. Uh, the, basically, everybody, everything ends up in the stream. You open the canopy, so way more light, so like the whole ecosystem shifts. And often what happens is that the stream get narrower and kind of get buried into the ground. So there's been a heap of study looking at those effects and also a lot of strategies trying to mitigate the effect of uh, forestry and logging. And one of them is what is called patch logging. So basically you, instead of clear cutting everything, you end up doing small parcels like that, less than 500 meters across. Uh, the idea behind that is like limited surface of impact equal limited effects and you'll have upstream and downstream buffering of the potential effect on, on that spot. So I did a postdoc in uh, southwestern France where uh, I basically looked at exactly that and often indicators in, I, there's a lot of indicators to look at those potential impacts which are hydromorphology, so depths, widths were of the stream, water chemistry, organic matter processing, invertebrates, fish, so I looked at all of that and everybody was happy because basically the effects were moderate to no. So if you've got small parcel of forage being cleared, it doesn't overly impact the stream and usually downstream you've got no consequences. 
So everybody was kind of happy. But being a good parasitologist that I am, I started kind of looking at other, other things. And one of the only parasites I could find is a nematode that uh, infects uh, Salmotruta, so the trout, which is the only fish in those systems. Uh, it lives in the gut, the eggs go out, and they get eaten accidentally by uh, mayfly larvae. And one specific species of mayfly larva that is uh, hyperaic, so they live in the sediment. And then when the trout eats that, then it picks up the infection. So I was like, oh, well, okay, nothing seems to be impacted by the, by the forestry practices. But what about those parasites? So what I did, I went back to the streams I used for the, the rest of the indicators. So I chose three streams. I looked at upstream at the cleared parcel and downstream. And I looked at the abundance of the specific host and the abundance of the parasites to see if the, there was something with the usual bioindicators that couldn't be detected but that the parasite could actually detect. So I started by sampling the uh, mayfly larva itself. And interestingly, even though the stream looked exactly the same, the abundance of uh, per square meter of those uh, mayfly larva, larvae was about one point something above the cleared patch. And as soon as you get to the cleared patch and the uh, abundance of those uh, mayfly larva got I think about seven, fold, seven to ten fold high, higher than uh, upstream of that impact. Even though it was really localized, we're talking like really tiny, tiny parcels being cleared. So I was kind of really surprised by that to start with. But it turned out there's been a few, a couple of studies on mayflies that show that when you, you like mayflies have the typical adults fly up larvae drift down, so every time they emerge, the adults tend to go up. And the problem with uh, cleared patches is that it creates a hedge effect. So the adults are perfectly able to navigate between trees, go up, 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 get out of the woods, get into the cleared uh, parcel, follow the stream, and then they get to the edge of the next parcel. And the very dense vegetation that gets created by that opening is a, is a barrier, uh, is a barrage. So those mayflies cannot navigate their way up the stream further than that clear patch. Which means that all those uh, adult mayflies will lay their eggs right there, which probably is why we end up with such an increase in the abundance of host in the clear patch and then downstream. Interestingly, the abundance of the parasite, which is a mean number of parasite per mayfly larva, it wasn't as clear, but it kind of went up as well. And that really we couldn't explain, but that wasn't the main goal of what I wanted to show. And if you actually add up the increase in mayfly larva abundance in the, and the increase of parasite abundance per larva, you end up with an increase of between seven, I think between 30 something and 50 fold in actual parasite density per square meter stream. So all else being equal, it looked like the forestry practices didn't impact the stream, but the truth is if you look at parasites, then you, you've got like massive impact in terms of density of parasites. So even though the, the surface of the impact was limited, when you look at some of the components, namely parasites, then the, the, the effects were large and were repercuting downstream. So because of mayfly larvae drift, then you end up with an impact that uh, kind of ripples downstream. Uh, the potential effects on fish, I don't know, because when I went to the agencies with my data, they were like, we don't care. <laughs> Even though the trout, that, that kind of specific uh, genetic breed of trout is endangered and massive conservation effort put on it, you tell them, well, the parasite might be going up 50-fold, and we have no idea what you can do to the fish. You're like, nah, it'll be fine. That's the answer. That nah, should be all right. OK. Well, you're cool. So basically, general conclusion, take a message. We are missing part of the picture by omitting parasites. If you look at the picture, what's it done for her to be upset like that? The truth is, that's so because you didn't look at the parasites. <laughs> so if you want the full picture, you need the parasites. 
So last take a message, one cannot just and sibling cannot ignore the role of parasites. So I put a picture of that because that's one of my favorite models, the amphipods and uh, acanthocephalans. And I know otters are super cute, so you're probably looking at an otter dispatching a crab for his dinner, but what I see is like a massive bag of parasites being uh, tran transmitted from the crab to the otter. Mm -hmm. And you sh that's the way you should look at that picture. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't see Mike, so I guess I am the uh, moderator for this. There are 11 minutes to go before 4 p.m., so um, ask away. <laughs> In your last example on patches, I'm assuming by the picture when they harvest patch, they harvest right down to the stream. Yeah. Yeah, like, funnily enough, it like better, like best practices for forestry, it's either you leave a riparian, like kind of margin, or you patch log, but they haven't combined both yet. So, in the case where you've got, uh, you know, one parasite, seems to produce soldiers to defend its... Does that uh, increase the lifetime of the host? I mean, is, is, it, is it keeping the host alive longer so it can do better, or is it strictly competing for acute resources? That's a, <clears throat> that's a good question. It's hard to answer, because it's hard to follow the, the host for its whole life. One thing I can tell you in the population of snail I was looking at is that the larger snails were infected snails, and infected snails that got really large was the one carrying parasites with division of labor and soldiers. So whether that's because it can kick out the competition and maintain the snail alive longer, or whether that's because they are actually actively trying to maintain their host, it's hard to say, but definitely the strategies hint that maybe the parasite is actually keeping its host alive and doing better than non-infected host in terms of a vehicle. Because of course the host is castrated, so biologically speaking, it's dead already. <laughs> but yeah, hard. How long do those parasites live in the host? Uh, several years. Several years? Yeah. Those like the, that specific species of snail probably lives six or seven years. Yeah. yeah. So it's definitely long, long lived. I think Casey had his hand up first. In your last example, so you show a, a logging practice has an effect on a species, which is it's always going to happen. If you find the right species, something's going to respond. I'm not exactly clear what you mean by an indicator. So it looked like everything else they measured didn't change. Yep. So parasite densities are indicating what, other than parasite densities change? Yeah, that's a good point. So, well, it's indicating that there is a modification in the system. So what the forestry industry wants to show is that there's no impact at all to what they do. That's showing that it's not the case, but also I wasn't allowed to do it because, like I say, we couldn't go further than that, but there might be cascading effects to that one species variation in density or whatever. It might have effect on the trout that will have effects on the whole trophic cascade. Can it be cheaper just to measure the fish directly? If you can. <laughs> we just like, that was in the pipes, but they were like, no, you're not touching the fish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I wonder how general do you think these edge effects could be as mediated by parasites? And what I'm getting at is that there's a massive literature on edge effects which are generally perceived to be negative for ecosystems. But they're also ecotones and, and usually um, at least the amount of biodiversity increases as not each species. And so do you think that parasites mediate kind of a general phenomenon of increased exposure to parasites or something like that that could explain um, some of the negativity of edge effects that's been hard to pin down on individual mechanisms such as rivers, nest predation, whatever? Well, yeah, that's, that's actually a complicated question. One thing I can answer is that often, if you modify an ecosystem, you got edge effect, you put some species on the edge of what they can do, and if you add parasite on top, on top of that, 
It might have like more than an additive effect. It might have an exponential effect because we're talking about like organisms that are already on the edge. So if you add that bit more pressure on them through the parasites, then it might, your effect might be more than just the sum of what you, you would expect. And also, some parasites will be negatively affected by any modification of the ecosystem and disappear. But it might, like, it's, it's not uniform, so it's really hard to predict unless you know exactly what you've got. If you, I don't know if I answer your question, but like, it's like host parasite interaction is so complex that as soon as you add like more variables to that, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. Especially when you talk about parasites that have like three hosts, so like complex life cycle, complex larvae, because any single, like on those trimetals, any single modification you, you make to the environment might have cascading effects that are really hard to predict. So definitely adds complexities, that's for sure. If you're looking for a clear answer, I don't have any. <laughs> Sorry. Andy, go back in Maya. Yeah, I think, yeah, Maya was first. Oh. <laughs> 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 um, I'm just wondering if there's anything known about those soldier parasites about the detection of the competitor. Like, how are they knowing when they're infected and and not attacking their own reproductive larvae. Yeah, so I've done some in vitro work on those guys. So they are definitely able to tell their own kind and not attack them. They are also able to tell their own species, but from a different colony apart from their own colony. So they will attack their own species and not their own colony. Right. Whether it's by touch or smell, it's unclear yet, but definitely there are they are mechanisms that allow them to tell whether it's a competitor, whether it's their own, or whether it's almost their own but not quiet. So they will definitely selectively attack or not what they what they encounter. My gut feeling uh, they need to be in contact to make a decision. I don't think this because the horse is a bath of chemicals, so. I think they really need close contacts before they actually dis decide to attack or not. Mm -hmm. And you actually see within the clonal colony, uh, soldiers will come into contact with one of their own reproductives and they will, they will probe. No, they, wi they will smell basically, they will probe and turn away. But if they start probing and it's not their own, then they'll start chewing, okay. basically. So, <clears throat> in a bunch of Insect parasitoids, one of the ancillary effects of paras insect parasitoids is they carry pathogens that will kill their hosts. So you end up in this bizarre situation in which you have a parasite that is transmitting a pathogen that kills the host that, so that it's going to die. Do you have any kind of parallels in what you see with your material? Well, not what, in what I do, but in the lab I was in New Zealand, that we were starting to look at inside the parasite, those, that whole... Because I know that parasitoid people are starting to realize that it's symbiotic with viruses and things like that. So there, there is probably, like even I study those guys for host manipulation and the mechanism is still unclear, so maybe they're actually using something else to, to do that. So the, how many layers? In, in what I do, I don't know yet. So it's another part of your Russian doll? Yeah, basically. I think there was one question back there, and, and then we probably have time for only a small question after that. Okay. At the very beginning of the talk, you showed a picture of sharks that had the parasites in their eyes. Does that mean that that group of sharks is blind or partially blind? Uh, so the, the parasite does blind the shark, but there has been no ill effect shown on sharks. That's very specific to that situation, that's because Greenland shark live deep, so it's completely dark, so they don't really need the high side. They're not, they're really slow, so it's not like a great white shark being blind, obviously it's going to run into problems. But Greenland sharks are super slow, live in the darkness, so, and like 100% of them basically carry the parasite or have like traces of past infection. And there's even been mention of uh, potential symbiotic association between the parasite 
and the shark, the parasite being yellow on a dark shark, people th some people think it might be used as bait <laughs> by the shark. So basically that worm dangling in the dark, attracting fish, yeah. and oh, too late, mistake, and the shark eating the fish. So basically, thanks for that image. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so to answer quickly your question, yeah, most of the shark get blind from the parasite. And Warren, the last one. So at what point in the life cycle in the, in the species with the two casts does the developing embryo differentiate into one or the other? Is it just that some It's ongoing. Bigger or, or We're still unsure of what the mechanism is, but so like. Can a soldier ever become? No. So that's, so, so yeah, there is a, a cutoff. Yeah. I've tried, so I've done in vitro, like, I was looking at whether the, like, paternity were able to detect how many, like, the cast ratios themselves to, ad to adjust, like, if there's too many soldiers we need to produce, or can soldiers become reproductive if there's no reproductive around? They can't, once, when the soldiers are soldiers forever. So even without competition, even feeding them more than ad libidum, in vitro, like, they just don't grow. So when do they start looking different? Uh, very early on. Like even, like even if, if the soldier is about that length, mm -hmm. you'll have reprodu like young reproductions about the same length, but you, already, you can already tell the difference. Because yeah. they're thicker and you can see the germinal mass that will produce the larvae after that. So it's basically they are produced as soldiers or reproductors. Okay, at this point we are at four o'clock. Would like uh, everyone to join me and thank you all for a fascinating story told well enough that even the blonde members of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.